let me do uh, record on the computer. Okay, so that will work. All right, so I got the, I got a polling question up. If you don't mind, could you please answer that polling question? Also, I should go. Can I, I can go live on Facebook, right? Ah, let's go live on Facebook. Michael, I'm gonna go ahead and go live on Facebook. Um, so I'm gonna share it on my. The more the merrier. Yeah, I'm gonna share on, on my timeline. If you get, well, I'll do the introduction if you want to. You can, uh, you can share it as well. So we're gonna go live on Facebook as well. Sorry, guys. We are, um, you know, I, I guarantee you, everyone in my neighborhood is streaming Netflix or something. So, <laughs> so the connectivity would, you know, would have its own, uh, its own challenges. Uh, so how to do remote work effectively? Yeah, it will work. Let's go live on Facebook. There we go. All right. All right, so I'm just hoping that that, that went live on Facebook. I won't spend any more time on that. All right. Welcome, everyone, to How to Do Remote Work Effectively. My name is Hector Garcia, and I have my friend Michael Lee, who's our guest speaker slash co-host, whatever you want to call it, for this, for this webinar. So we're really excited. Um, about it. And, um, you know, just in case you're watching this recording in the future, today is March 17th, 1 p.m. Eastern. And I'm not going to lie to you guys, you know, the, the genesis of this webinar certainly is because of the coronavirus and, and the, the crazy times that we're living on right now. However, we would like to uh, shift away the focus from the virus itself and also from the current situation and talk about just doing remote work in general. We will love this, uh, this webinar uh, itself or this series, if we end up doing a series, to be timeless and to be a testament of the new times where, you know, technology and econ the economy itself pushes more people to be working from home or remotely. And we'll talk about all these uh, nuances behind it. So real quick, a couple of timely announcements. We had a webinar originally scheduled this week on Thursday the 19th. Uh, we are postponing that. My guest speaker uh, who works with restaurants for the most part had to, had to uh, uh, postpone as well. So we're gonna postpone that specific episode, QuickBooks Online for restaurant and retail, probably at some point April and May. So I apologize that uh, for, for, for you guys that were looking forward to this week's webinar. The next episode after that, April 16th, which is productivity and efficiency tips for QuickBooks Online Power users, will go on as scheduled. So expect that episode to uh, drop April 16th, Thursday, April uh, 16th. Um, on um, this particular series, doing remote work effectively might become its own webinar series. We're gonna gauge uh, the feedback. We're gonna see if it warrants it, that we cover enough you know, based on your comments, based on what you guys tell us, do we need to just kind of focus on helping people transition to remote work? Should this be a permanent webinar series that we start working on? So we'll, we'll see uh, at the end of this webinar, we will know uh, for sure. Uh, let me make sure, Michael, can you double check that my, uh, that my microphone is, it's good. Yep. It's great. It sounds yeah. good. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then also, um, and also the new webinar series, QuickBooks Desktop for Manufacturers and Wholesalers, which is scheduled to start May 21st. That's still going to go on. That's not uh, going to change. All right. So those are the only timely announcements I wanted to cover. So today's content, we'll talk about the speakers real quick. We'll talk about why now, the difference between reacting to the circumstances and leading towards probably the new, the new normal that we're going to have to be dealing with. Uh, solo practitioners in a home office versus remote teams working are in two entirely different contexts. So keep in mind that we are, we, we, we are going to speak to both groups, but in some cases, we, especially Michael, who has a team, a pretty large team that works remote. And this happened two, three years ago, you know, without any foreseeable, any, any, you know, any, any foreseeable circumstances in which, you know, the whole world will be forced to work from home. Like, so this is something that he's already been doing, you know, under standard business model circumstances. And like myself, I'm, I'm not a solo practitioner. I'm kind of halfway in between, 
but I've been working from home for a very long time. So I'll tell you about, about my experiences with that as well. Then we'll talk about short-term and long-term implications. Hopefully, you know, a lot of you like working at the office. A lot of you like working at your client's offices. So hopefully this circumstance might, is only a short-term circumstance, but there might be some long-term implications. There might be some permanent changes in the world that's going to, um, that might shift most people to uh, do less unnecessary travel, unnecessary driving. Um, so this might be a new normal. Now we'll talk about what changes and what doesn't change, right? So some things are going to change, some things don't. So don't lose sight of, you know, who you are, what your business does, what your end goal is, just because you're doing it from home instead of whatever else it was, doesn't change your, your objectives, doesn't change the outcomes. Uh, Michael's going to talk about the routines and rituals, right? What are, what are the things that he does and his team does in order to stay, stay sane, stay productive, stay uh, collaborative? Um, then Michael will talk about setting up your environment, right? An, a, an environment that's conducive to remote work and, you know, how to set up everybody's expectations because people need to understand that people are working from home. It's its own circumstance in itself. And, uh, and then I'm going to shift over. I'm going to take over after that in the second half. And then I'll talk about some valuable questions to ask yourself and your clients about business interruption. You're not going to want to miss those five questions. They're absolutely fabulous. I stole them from somebody else's podcast, and I'll give them credit when, when the time is due. And then at the very end, I'll talk about recommended apps, tools, hardware, to work effectively from home. And I wanna give you a quick preview because it's gonna be a 100 minute webinar. We are gonna go through remote desktop tools. We're gonna go through uh, comparing, you know, TeamViewer, Zoom, all these things. We're gonna talk about QBox, Right Networks, self-hosting. We'll talk about some, uh, some other hosting platforms, web productivity tool. So cloud accounting apps, hardware. I mean, we're gonna go through this whole thing towards the end, so hopefully, um, if you're looking forward to that part, because I know a lot of people like to talk about the, the hardware and the tools, that's going to be sort of towards the second half. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and Advanced QuickBooks Pro Advisor. I'm the CEO, president, whatever you want to call it, of my accounting firm, which is based in Miami, Florida. I'm also a YouTuber. If you search my name in YouTube, you see my channel, tons of content around accounting, QuickBooks, and some practice management things. I served the Intuit Accounting Council a couple of years ago, which, which was wonderful, but by far the very best part about the Accounting Council is meeting new people like Michael. And Michael and I are really good friends today because we served the Intuit Accounting Council a couple of years ago. And we also co-host a podcast called Friday Night Live that goes live on Fridays on Facebook. Michael Lee is a serial entrepreneur cloud accounting professional. He's the CEO of an accounting bookkeeping firm called Reconciled. He's also the CEO of an app, an up and coming app called Sassable, which is an app that it's aimed to help people that charge uh, monthly subscription type uh, services, um, that uh, whether it's a service or an app, and maybe he'll talk about that a little bit. And he's also the co-founder of Humly, or Humly, which is a HR sort of uh, staff management uh, type of business and uh, he could discuss that in detail. Uh, his firm was recognized as a top Intuit firm of the future firms in the competition of 2016 and 2018. He served the Intuit Accounting Council with me and also the Zero Council and he's had an MBA from Babson and he's, a, as I mentioned, co-host of Friday Night Live. Michael, did I miss anything about you? It's all good. All right. So some initial thoughts. So these are the couple of thoughts I want to say before we get into the meat and potatoes of the webinar. Number one, my personal thought is don't let this circumstance define you, redefine you, define your business. You have the power to, to, to reassess your business. You have the power to hit the reset button and, and fix some things about your business. You have the power to redesign your business. Don't let the environment change it. You drive the change. You need to be the leader of this change. Whether you're a solo practitioner, a leader of a fractional remote team, or a team member of a team that is now shifting into remote work. The other thing that I thought is, even last night, I got a bit sentimental. I saw Chris Martin, the lead singer of, of Coldplay, go live on Instagram and play music for his fans from his home 
by himself. And this is a, a, a hashtag together at home. And I just wanna, I wanna relay the message that we as a humanity, we are making the sacrifices, making this effort to fight this invisible enemy that we never thought we would, we would need to. So, so think about what you're doing as that grain of salt that you're putting, not a grain of salt, that whatever it is, that, that your little piece that you're putting towards healing the world and making the world better. So try to see the silver lining behind this circumstance. I'll have a little section where I talk about what I think the productivity silver lining is out of all that. But um, those are my initial thoughts. So from now on, it's all about encouraging others to work remote, encouraging others, help people work remote. Only us keeping the cogs of the economy moving forward together, helping each other, we're going to get out of this quicker. So that's why Michael and I, I think Michael and I share the same sentiment. That's why we said last minute, let's put one of these things together and let's talk to the community and let's, let's lead and pave the way to what needs to be done in order to get everything moving. So Michael, with that, I'll give you the floor. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hector, for that introduction. Um, this is really, really exciting. Uh, uh, I think the webinar that we're going to do together, but also very interesting uh, time together um, that we're going to have. And so um, Hector, you want, do you want to uh, have me share the slides or you want to go ahead and just keep the slides up? From yours? Yeah, I could do that. Just okay, tell me great. next. Just say great, tell great. me next. Great, awesome. So yeah, so um, we're in a unique and interesting time. And and as Hector said, uh, my company reconciled. Um, we've been working remotely. Uh, we have a team of 29 people now um, working from nine different states across the country, all employees working from home. And we've been uh, running a business model in remote work for a long time, um, ever since I started uh, reconciled. And so this is a situation that's new to not new to us, but maybe new to many of you. I know that m many in the accounting profession, um, especially solo practitioners, um, maybe are used to remote work, used to remote, uh, uh, working remotely um, normally. Uh, but most of our peers, most Americans, most people in the industry are not. Um, and so this is the opportunity for us to uh, take, uh, become leaders and take charge in this situation, this time now. Um, we don't know how long the situation is going to last, right? Uh, the, some say a, a couple weeks, some say a few months. Um, imagine, it last, imagine it lasting through the end of this year. Whatever situation that is, you may learn by working remotely. You may learn by uh, leading in this situation instead of just reacting that there are some permanent decisions you want to make with your business model if you don't currently work remotely permanently that you will learn during this time period. And so as a solo practitioner or working with teams, this is your opportunity to experiment and lead with a business model that may actually, actually be more beneficial for you and your business um, than the traditional business model of working from a traditional office. So if you think about the changes that you can make uh, during this time and why that's important right now, um, I think... I think that this is your opportunity to do so. You know, uh, Hector and I were talking last night about how the excuses we make for making changes to our business, often the excuse is time. I don't have time. Well, many of us have a lot of time now. <laughs> We've been given time on a platter now, and we can take this opportunity to use that time to think about our business and about reshaping it into a, a permanent business model that can help us be successful. And again, this is a matter of a matter of leading. Um, what can we do to lead right right now? Uh, Hector, move on to the next slide. So, as a solo practitioner, um, home office versus remote teams, right? Many of you, many of you watching, um, are solo practitioners, and many are in in the accounting profession are solo practitioners, um, or many service providers are also solo practitioners. So you uh, providing uh, this kind of service from home, um, you're, you might be used to it. But now, um, but if you're not, if you're used to going to a co-working space, going into um, an actual physical office, and you don't have your mind wrapped around um, what this is like, this is your opportunity to think through as a solo practitioner, what uh, can you do to be a better uh, service provider from your home office? Um, 
as you are either self-quarantining or quarantining on purpose in order to help um, with uh, help the tide of this of this uh, virus. Also, you think about how you can communicate with your customers um, as a solo practitioner, as well as the dip, the other different things you may need to do, um, especially if you're you're still going into people's offices as a solo practitioner. Um, that that's a physical presence. How you need to change your business model and delivery. Um, remote teams is a different uh, different experience, and that's what I'm used to and uh, more used to. In that, uh, when you have team members or a large team that now is all shifted from a physical office to a remote location, you're going to have to think through the different ways in which you want to both conduct uh, team meetings. You want to serve each other. Um, you want to serve your employees. You want to keep each other accountable. You want to check in with that team, but also the reality that this transition not only is a transition to home, but a transition to the new realities facing life on an everyday basis. So um, how you approach serving remote teams will have some additional changes that will need to be required from you, especially as a leader. Um, Hector, let's move to the next slide. Short-term versus long-term. So for some of you, you're thinking of uh, this being only a short-term decision and there, you only want to make changes in the short term because you want to go back to your business as usual when uh, the requirements to stay at home are no longer there. Um, but the one thing we want you to think about is there are some short-term decisions you're going to have to make, and there are some clients that you're probably serving that some of the changes you want to make to work virtually are not going to be possible. Um, but we want you to think in the long term as well. What are some of the things that you're going to learn during this time of working from home and working remotely that are going to be beneficial not only to yourself, but to your company, to your team, to your customers, um, and also something that you're going to want to keep permanently long term? So don't think about um, communicating um, these changes just as short term, only a few weeks or only a few months measures, because you honestly don't know how long that will go but also maybe it's something that you see as highly beneficial for you and your firm and how you serve uh, your customers and your employees. Let's go to the next slide. So what changes? This is what I want you to think about um, in regards to the changes that you need to make um, now and over the next few weeks. What do you and your employees need to change about how you deliver your service? You know, what do you need to change? Do you need to change how uh, your clients deliver you work papers or your employees deliver you papers? Uh, do, you need, do you or your employees need to change how you interact with your customers? Do you need to um, add a video co conferencing component, a phone conferencing component? Uh, do you need to stop going in person? Obviously, that's some, something that everyone's had to do. So what are some of those things that you're needing to change right now in order to make your service del delivery delivery effective. Um, the, the, the second question you want to ask yourself is, what do you need to change about how you conduct internal meetings and external meetings? Right? So internal meetings being the in meetings with your team and external meetings, the meetings with your customers. Now, you might be used to doing these meetings in person, physically. So ask yourself the question, what do you need to change about those meetings? How should those meetings be conducted so that they're still be efficient and productive? What attitude changes are required from you and from your employees to mentally shift from I serve my customers in person from, from a or at their physical office to I serve my customers from a home office 100% of the time? The reality is you're going to have to serve, you're going to have to continue providing your service on a remote basis. And if you're not used to doing that, ask yourself that question, question. What attitude changes do I have to make? What mental changes do I have to make? And do my teammates have to make in order to do this effectively? So those three questions, what do you need to change about your service delivery? What do you, do you change about your internal meetings and your external meetings? And what attitude changes are going to be required for you to mentally shift from serving your customers in person to serving them externally? 100% of the time, or remotely 100% of the time. Write those down. Write these changes down. It's really important. You want to write them down so that they become a reality in front of you. And 
that that's you know those these questions are really important for you to ask yourself because if you can sit down and ask yourself and imagine your firm transitioning transitioning um, in this moment to this new reality it's going to help you it's going to help you think objectively through this instead of letting the emotions you may be experiencing drive of the decisions you make. You want to be able to think through this objectively. So write these questions down and write your answers down to them. What changes do you need to make in order to be effective and what doesn't change, right? There's a reality. A lot of things don't change. If you already use email, you don't have to change your email system. You probably don't have to change your email system. If you use a laptop for all your work, you don't have to change your laptop. Um, but you might need to get increased internet, um, internet at home. You might need to um, do specific things that Hector's going to talk about later, and I'm going to talk about to your environment at home. So what changes have to happen? Write those question, changes down and um, communicate. It is really important that whatever changes you need to make, you communicate it very clearly and as often as possible and as soon as possible with both your team, your employees, your customers, your family members, your friends. It's really important you communicate these changes because these changes are going to help you uh, be successful, but you also need to let other people know you're making these changes so they're not surprised. Now, remember, the situation we're in has been a surprise to all of us. And whatever situation you're in in the future with your business is going to be a, most likely going to be a surprise unless you plan for it. So writing down the, the changes that you need to make and communicating them as often as possible is going to be very important for you. Remember, this is a time for leadership, and this is an opportunity for you as a professional in whatever field you're in, especially accounting. This is a time for you to lead. If you have customers and employees, they're all feeling emotions right now. They're all feeling anxious, unstable, many of them. There is going to be a rare opportunity right now for you to lead and the best leaders are going to be able to lead during this time or at any time where there's change. So if you can make this situation a positive time for you and your business, a time for growth, a time for strengthening of your business, and a time for considering other business models and innovation, this is going to be, it's going to be really important for you. And it's going to also let you flex that leadership muscle that you've wanted to flex for a long time. The accounting profession and other service industries are already set up for this time period. Can you imagine your business coming out of this period of time and actually more valuable, stronger, with more revenue and better customers? Can you imagine that? That's what I want you to imagine for yourself and for your business right now. So DIY exercise number one. Hector, go to the next slide and then we'll do a poll. DIY exercise um, Number one, write down the top three changes you need to make today in order to serve yourself, your employees and team members, and your customers better with the new reality in front of us. Now, this is an exercise you not only can, um, can do now, you can do this every three to six months. Do this exercise. Write down the top three changes you need to make today in order to serve yourself, your employees and team members, and your customers better with the new reality in front of us. So that's a DIY exercise you wanna do um, after this webinar. Uh, Hector, let's go ahead and do a poll. Hector's gonna give a poll up here. Okay, so in addition to Michael's exercise, so writing down the top three changes you need to make today to serve yourself, your team and your clients better. Um, answer the quick polling question here. What are the biggest challenges you have for working remote for the people that are working remote? If you're using Zoom to answer this on the top uh, icon bar of Zoom, there should, there should be a little icon that says poll for you to enable it. If it doesn't pop up, it doesn't pop up for everyone and answer that. And if you're watching this recorded afterwards, you're watching it on Facebook, Tell us, put in the comments, what are your biggest challenges? I know a lot of people have no challenges already. 20% of you already do remote work mm -hmm. or, or the challenge is some other issue. But uh, the idea behind this is I'm going to share the results that you see that we're, we're all in this issue together. And the most important thing that Michael said is, look, you're going through changes. 
and your clients are going through changes, mm -hmm. right? So don't, don't, don't be like, don't, don't, like, don't worry about the fact that you're, you're going to serve your clients differently. Don't worry about what is my client going to think, mm -hmm. you know, about the way I'm serving them now. Uh, I think you can both lead the changes and also tell your client, hey, we're going through changes too. Uh, you know, let's navigate this together. Mm -hmm. If you, you can, look, you can have this deeper relationship with your clients to tell them, hey, if you find any interesting tools out there that, that are working really well for you, that you think I should try on, let me know. And I promise you, I'll do the same. As I navigate this, as I find the tools that I like, the techniques, the process, whatever it is, I'm going to communicate it with you guys and share it on social media, share it with your colleagues, share it with your clients. Again, if the whole world economy tanks, we're all down. A racing tide races all ships. If we, through our clients, can lead this change positively and help them you know, navigate this and also have them understand that we're having challenges navigate this, together by simply by communicating yep. we have all the tools we have social media i mean we have we have, we're, we're living in an incredible time to be able to do this this 100 years ago would have been much different people would have been a lot more depressed a lot more lonely and i know it feels lonely to stay at home and sometimes it's boring and my kids personally drive me nuts so i'm pretty sure <laughs> it's driving drive you nuts as well but at the end of the day when we come out of this you know are we going to be lagging and following everybody else to see what works or we're going to be leading it by testing it and trying and telling people it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to navigate this it's okay that my internet had issues today because everybody's yep. using netflix in my house one thing i will tell you that michael made a good point is we might have to spend a little bit more money on comcast or or at&t or whatever we might need to up our bandwidth you know i did that already before because i upload a lot of videos and i have to have a lot of bandwidth because my kids use YouTube and Netflix and stuff. But the, obviously this might be welfare for Comcast and, and all the internet companies. But I think a lot of us are going to have to up, you know, get the commercial accounts, get, get the higher guaranteed uh, upstream because sometimes uh, Comcast or whatever, when they uh, advertise one gigabit downstream, okay, that's great. But upstream, which is us uploading, us putting videos up, us communicating, we need to do that as well. All right, let's go ahead and end that poll and let's share the results. So thank you very much for that. Most of you is finding the right tools and apps to help with productivity. So that's good. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go ahead and cover that uh, pretty pretty soon. Uh, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, that's it, right? Your, your part is done? Um, yeah, you, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, you're going to do silver lining here and then yeah, yeah. the next one. Yeah, so, so all, all I want to say about the silver lining is, as I, I think Michael already uh, said this is, Every single time I try to help my colleagues by recommending them that they create videos in YouTube or they write blog articles or that they read a new book or that they learn a new skill, whatever it is, right? So every time I, I suggest people to do that, um, most of the time the excuse is, I don't have time. I don't have time. I never have time. The world is moving so fast. And I know that some of you are still as busy as you were last week. And hopefully it'll continue to be that. But I have some, something inside of me tells me that the whole world will slow down a little bit for most people. It will just slow down. People will, people will slow down. They have to, mm -hmm. right? As they, as they come to their senses and try to hit the reset button and re-engineer their lives, uh, they probably will. It will slow down a little bit. So while it slows down, you know, go back and do the things that you never thought you had time to do. Because right now, if we come out of this thing three months from now and you have now 20 blog articles ready to post, three YouTube videos ready to post, you learn two new apps, you learn a new, a new skill, uh, you, 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 learn, you learn a little bit about marketing, whatever, that's going to be a real positive thing. All right. So that's it, Michael. Uh, routines and rituals. I'll give it back to you. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Hector. So um, the, the next thing you want, you'll want to focus on after you you've begin thinking through the changes you want to make as a business is there's routines and rituals you'll want to set up. I call the, all, I call these the rhythms, rhythms of your business, right? These are the routines and rituals um, you'll want to set up for your business. Now we're all creatures of habit and, and much of our social interactions occur at the office, especially if you work uh, with a company or at a company, even with clients. Um, most of your social interactions happen 
at the office. And many of these interactions are, are intentional, uh, but some are not, such as small talk around the office, the jokes we tell one another walking down the hallway, or the improv to come c- c- coffee or lunch outing. You know, when you, when you see an office mate and you're going to go out for coffee or lunch, or you ask somebody if they want to walk to Starbucks, all, things, all those things happen. And I think we take for granted how much of those social interactions are impromptu and fulfill the social needs we have throughout the day. Um, not only do we benefit from those uh, social interactions, we also have just the regularly scheduled uh, meetings, work-related meetings, and unscheduled meetings that are focused on work-related topics. And you might have team meetings where you're working on projects together. We all be- also benefit from those, and we're able to ha- be highly productive because of um, the work environment in the physical office. Now, uh, imagine that you have to create all these interactions virtually, right? All these interactions, both uh, both um, scheduled and unscheduled, work-related, unwork-related, have to be recreated virtually now in order for you to still fulfill the social connection that you, you desire that we all human beings need. Um, but you got to do it virtually now because you're going to be doing it from home or working remotely. So uh, think about, also think about how often you're in the same physical space as your coworkers or your clients, right? Imagine, um, imagine being in the same physical space, how often you're, you're in that space and all the conversations throughout that occur throughout the day. Now, imagine all of that gone and you have to figure out how to do that in a virtual environment. Those are the things that many of us don't sit and think through a lot, but those are the things that I want you to think through is, is those interactions, those, um, those touch points you have physically in person with people, we're going to have to do that virtually. Now, Hector's going to discuss later about the tools to conduct those types of interactions, but I want to talk about the types of interactions you'll want to consider and that you'll want to intentionally plan in your calendar. Now, if you're not doing this already as a solo practitioner, I think these are really recommended because these are these are going to help you up your game in regards to your interaction with your customers and contractors and teammates that you may have. But if you're working with a team, you definitely need these because these are already embedded in a in office environment. You're going to need these for remote work. So, the four uh, I, I I call these five types, right? There's five types. There's the regularly scheduled meetings. So you have regularly scheduled meetings. You might have a Monday morning or Tuesday morning staff meeting. You might have a, uh, a monthly all-company hands-on-deck meeting. Um, you might have team meetings related to a project. Those things still need to be on your calendar. So you want to put those um, on your calendar and make sure that they're there. And you may want to increase the frequency of those because of remote work. If you're not used to doing those remotely, you might want to increase the frequency until you get used to the idea of, connecting remotely on those regularly scheduled meetings. And those are the work-related meetings. Then there's the um, unscheduled work meetings. So these are things that we normally do by stopping by somebody's office, right? Or somebody stopping by somebody's cubicle or saying, just calling out their name if we're in the same room. And so if Hector and I are in the same room in the same office, I might stop by his office and say, hey, I got a quick question about this thing I can't solve or this issue I have or somebody called um, and, and needs an answer for this you're going to have to figure out how to conduct those unscheduled meetings. And so Hector is going to talk about some of the tools that allow you to communicate quickly with one another online, but then also jump on a quick video call or phone conference to deal with some of those uh, situations. The quick touch base, the quick touch base um, is a quick 15 minute or less touch base kind of type of meeting where you're touching base and Oftentimes, I see remote teams doing this type of meeting every single day. So they might do one right in the morning when the workday starts just to get everyone on the same page in the, begin- in the morning. And then at the end of the day, doing a quick touch base to kind of review what did everybody accomplish that day and what is still left on the back burner to be completed the next day. Quick t- touch bases are, are, are really great, especially if you have a new team member that just started at your company and you didn't get time to physically in person train them. Well, um, quick touch bases allow you to, to, to touch base, make sure that they're doing okay, make sure they have enough work for the day and that they know what they're doing. And so those, these are great with team members and also with your direct reports. Um, th- those three, the regularly scheduled meetings, the unscheduled meetings, and quick touch base, those all relate to work-related items. The two other types of meetings I want you to w- focus on and be intentional about in your calendar are scheduled 
personal meetings or non-work related meetings and unscheduled non-related work related meetings. Now, what do I mean by that? The scheduled times and the unscheduled non-work related are those small talk interactions. We get those at the office. And if you count how many of those happen throughout a day, it is amazing how much of your time is spent on personal interactions that have nothing to do with the work, but they fill the void. They fill the breaks. They fill the five minutes of, of brain rest. They fill the the water cooler moments or the lunchtime moments that you have throughout your day. So you want to actually schedule these in your day. So a scheduled time might be, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to have a virtual lunch, a Zoom or a virtual lunch conference call open so that as everybody's eating lunch throughout the day um, or during the lunch hour, they can drop in for 5, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they can say hi to somebody. Um, those, are, those would be scheduled. Another, another thing would be and we do at Reconciled. I do a, a bi-weekly coffee or a lunch with the CEO. So everyone knows Michael Lee is going to be on Zoom for coffee or for lunch at a set specific time and that my team members can come and interact with me. And so if you're the leader, especially if you're a, the CEO or one of the leaders of your company, having a very a scheduled time on the calendar where everyone knows you're definitely going to be on, that you're not going to move that or, or, or reschedule that time, and you're going to have coffee or lunch for the sake of connecting with people, that's great. And again, these are non-work-related times. So you're not doing these meetings to talk about work. You're doing these meetings to specifically discuss a life, to share about your life, to share about what's going on at home, to share about the chaos going on in your own house as well, um, and to just touch base about things, about life, about movies, about the news, or whatever. Um, these are important because you do these things at work already, um, and many of us are just unaware of these. Uh, and so you want, you want these times to be able to connect and create that at the water cooler vibe at work. And we even, um, at Reconciled on our Slack channel, we even have a channel called at the water cooler for these specific reasons, for people to post funny memes, for people to post jokes and to talk about the things that matter to them. Um, the unscheduled non-work related would be just creating impromptu moments. So, you know, if you have a five or 10 minute break in your day or in the middle of your day, or you have a 15 minute break, check in with a team member. Say, hey, how you doing? I want to just touch base for five, 10 minutes and, and just see how you're doing at home or how your kids are doing. Um, those are going to go a long way to show your leadership at your company and also that your employees care. You can also do any of these types of meetings with your customers. So if you're not doing both um, professional and also impromptu, uh, not work really related meeting with customers, this is a great time for you to reach out to your customers now this week by phone or by email and say, hey, I want to check in on you. Um, you know, CEO to CEO or business owner, to business owner, just to see how you're doing, not to, not to talk about work. Just want to see how you're doing. If there's anything I could be doing for you personally, especially for those clients that you love working with and you really have gotten to know, this is a great opportunity to call them. Just let them know you care because everyone's going through the same thing. So DIY exercise number two, let's go ahead that, that on the slides here. What scheduled meetings and as important unscheduled meetings do you need to put on your team on your and your team's calendar in order to facilitate these routines and rituals? Okay. How can you begin creating intentionally on your calendar these routines and rituals um, to help you connect with team members as well as customers? Uh, and and again, I would encourage you to do it more often now if you're not used to remote work, if your clients aren't used to it either. If you do it often now, you can always taper it back, but it lets you get in the habit and lets you form the habit of interacting virtually with each other um, and encouraging one another. Hector, do you have any other thoughts or um, any, uh, anything else when you're thinking about this? Yeah, I, I like to um, answer one person's question or comment here in the chat that said, are you still work? Are you still talking about remote work? This all sounds like things that we do at the office. And I think what Michael is telling, Michael is, is saying is we can, we can translate what we used to do at the office, but now it's done via Zoom. Yeah. So I think this is a testament, this is a testament that nothing really changes. All it changes is the delivery method in which the two human beings communicate and share with each other. So instead of moving a piece of paper around the office or going into the water cooler, or having lunch together in a physical sense, you could do it all this via Zoom. Yeah. I mean, this I think maybe he failed to say that is that Michael's firm is a Zoom friendly firm. Like right. with Zoom is they use Zoom for everything. And we'll right. talk about Zoom and I'll compare with other tools 
a little bit later on. But yeah, I think that's the point. That's the point that Michael's trying to make is nothing really changes. You still do the same thing. Uh, just you just have to manage some anxiety and uncertainty around it, but nothing really changes. Right. And and remember, and the reason why this is important is because most of us, most people in our society aren't used to remote work yet. It's still not the majority. And so you'll want to create this. You, you, and, and exactly, you know, as Jill said, somebody said on the post here, people are going to feel lonely. If you, if you go cold turkey on your social interactions and you go, especially if you live by yourself or maybe you live with uh, just family and, and you get most of your other social interactions outside at your office, that you're going to go cold turkey and if you only interact when you have scheduled video meetings, then uh, if you only have interact with scheduled video meetings, then um, you may only meet with each other. You may see somebody at work once or twice a week, but you have a 40-hour week to fill, sometimes 50-hour week to fill that you get at an office. So you don't want to deprive people of the amazing connections that you have at the office, and you're basically trying to mimic those and build those right now virtually and this is an opera for you to do that so let's go to the last topic environment and i'll be real quick about this because i want hector to be able to jump into the tools environment and expectations so you want to create an at-home environment to make your remote work effective hector's going to talk about some of the tools to help you with that can you create a dedicated space at home where you can focus on your work and not be distracted by your children pets or spouse right or roommate Right? Can you create a dedicated space at home, no matter how small it is, a dedicated space to focus on your work and not be distracted? Show up to that dedicated space like it's your office. Don't show up like you're at home. Show up like it's your office. That means putting on clothes that you normally would wear to the office and prepare yourself mentally and physically to show up. Right? Brush your teeth, put makeup on, wash your face, take a shower, do the things you would normally do before you go in an office. Okay. Do you, have a, do you have a professional looking space or backdrop for your video meetings? You want to make sure that the background you have behind that space is, is something you would want your customers or employees to see. So I don't recommend a kitchen. I know some of you, that's the only place you can do it is the kitchen table. I don't recommend a kitchen. I don't recommend a room that's cluttered. I don't recommend your bedroom even, unless your bedroom is always picked up in the morning. I recommend a space that's just professional looking is something that you don't mind your employees and your customers to look at. And then um, this is important. Make sure you have the conversation with your family members and roommate or roommates about what you need to do in order to make this successful. So what do you need at home so that your environment is successful for you to conduct this remote work? What do you need to do at home? And so if that means you need to carve out some of the garage or some of the living room or some of the bedroom, and, and do that, you need to make sure that you have that conversation with your family, your kids, your friends, so that it'll be really important for you. So exercise number three, the last one to do, what changes do you need to make at your at-home environment? What, need, what changes do you need to make to your dedicated work at home environment to be more effective, right, in order to be effective? Um, Hector, you can put that question up on the screen there and then uh and then i'm gonna i bring it over to hector to, to to wrap this up with tools what changes do you need to make to your dedicated work at dedicated work at home and space in order to be effective so just just think about that and have those conversations with your family members and, and um and and roommates in order so that you can be effective at at, at, at working from home now in this in this time period all right hector i'll, I'll bring it over to you now Awesome, Mike. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, you know, hang out the chat, answer some questions for as long as you can. I know you have to go soon. So thank you for um, gi giving us some food for thought on the multi-team thing. Guys, I want to tell you something. I, I was so impressed when I met Mike. He's got, what, 25 people working for you, Mike? Is that, is that about yeah, right? Yeah, 29 now, yeah. 29 people work in what, seven states, eight states? What was it? Nine states. Nine different states. 29 people working in nine different states. Michael literally started his business at a, out of a WeWork and said, we're going to have a remote bookkeeping firm. People can work at WeWork. They can work from home. They can work whatever we want. We're going to make every employee almost like a business owner, right? That has all the responsibilities over their clients, but they are employees. And right from the get-go, you, you thought about the problem, you know, uh, with the end in mind. You're like, what tools am I going to need to work remotely? What type of talent do I need to hire? 
remote work, and then you went out and started expanding. So I'm just completely fascinated by how, how quickly his business has grown. And, uh, and I have learned so much from Michael. Michael's been such a good friend. And I, it's funny, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a high tech person with tons of YouTube videos, with tons of uh, popularity as a consultant. And I've been struggling the last two weeks. I've been scrambling to get my team remote, to get our phone systems uh, working, to get uh, even some of my employees weren't using Zoom already, you know? So like I, I started realizing, so I, I realized so quickly, it hit me so hard how much I underestimated how techy we were or how ready we were for this type of change. And I've been telling Michael this last couple of weeks and he just keeps laughing because it's just funny and, 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 and ironic in many, in many ways. So, um, so anyway, let's go ahead and make the transition and let's talk about uh, recommended apps, tools, and hardware. For some of you, this is probably the ones that's the stuff that you want it right? Because a lot of you are, are not in teams. But again, if, if any of you collaborate with clients or are in teams, any of the stuff that Michael said, go back and listen to it again. Um, I think it's fantastic. So Michael, thanks. Thanks for that. And also another quick note, if you go to the bit.ly link that's up there in the slides, bit.ly forward slash work remote, all uppercase, the notes of all the, like, all the site notes that Michael talked about are in the notes section. So you can actually read the notes uh, from there as well. All right, so let's talk about types of desktop computing collaboration tools. Now, desktop computing means that for whatever reason, one of the tools that you use or your clients use is not a web-based application. And, you know, like Microsoft Excel, not the online version, like QuickBooks Desktop, whatever type of tools that they use are desktop native tools, you're gonna require some sort of desktop computing or collaboration tools. So I'm going to split them into five, five categories, remote control tools, remote access tools, desktop hosted managed services, self-managed cloud computing, and file sharing tools. In some cases, you would just be using one from each category or just one period. In some cases, you might be using a combination. So let's talk about the definition of the terms first. So what is a remote control tool. So what I mean by control means the tool is used to take control over another desktop, right? So I need to remote into the desktop and control the desktop. The problem with remote control is that you are taking over the operation of the other person. And if you remote control, the other person cannot do its own work individually. Control is really good for when the other computer is owned by you or is controlled by you and you're not messing anyone's uh, access to the computer, or if you're trying to do hands-on training, remote control is great. Now, remote access is different, right? and there's two types. There's self-hosted and there's managed hosted. So self-hosted means you have your own server. You have IT people. You control your own user permissions. You control your own hardware. The server is probably in your office. In my case, I brought, we have two servers. We have a QuickBooks server and a tax server here in our in our office and i brought my tax server home because i didn't want to be interrupted but we left our quickbooks server back in the office so long story short that's how it worked out for us but I, i'm kind of a ex it professional so i know how to how to manage my own server plus i have a great it person that helps me if i need to but self-hosted is going to require probably you getting deep into windows uh, server user permissions uh, security, all sorts of things, or have a trusted IT person that doesn't make a hole in your wallet to help you with that. Then we have desktop hosted managed services, which will increase, which will significantly decrease the IT costs because the access to the server and the service to control, manage, and administer it, it's all bundled into one. And this is used to run applications or to have desktop type applications that are running but I need a desktop environment, Microsoft Windows environment. It's hosted by a service and we pay that service for them to guarantee 99.9% .9 uptime or whatever it is. Then we have self-managed cloud computing, which is kind of um, the hybrid between a self-hosted remote system um, and a, a hosted managed service. So a self-managed cloud computing means you have the same thing as a managed remote 
system, but you control and access it and make changes to it and administer it just like a remote access tool. So we'll talk about those two. And then finally, we have file sharing, which simply means we have a Word document, a PDF document, an Excel document, uh, whatever. We have it on, on, a, on a folder in my computer somewhere, and I need another user, a team member, a client to access it or collaborate on it uh, using the cloud. Uh, and because for whatever reason, that file type cannot be used in a web, you know, in a native web-based tool. So let's go through the tools. So on the remote control side, we have apps like Splashtop. I'm going to talk about the pricing and the pros and cons of each from my perspective really quick. Uh, we, we have Splashtop, we have TeamViewer, we have LogMeIn, and we have GoToMyPC. I think that probably these are the five to choose from or the five to think about if you need remote control. For remote access, if you're going to be self-hosted, remember, you need to have Windows 10 Pro. Most people don't have Pro unless they specifically order that way or Microsoft Windows Server in order to be able to do a, a, a standard remote desktop connection, which is sometimes called RDC or terminal services. Then if you are going to go to a hosted service. As a matter of fact, actually, let me make a modification to this slide here. This is actually cloud nine. Yep. Sorry, there was a mist mistake there. So if we go to a hosted managed service, we have the, the probably the two biggest ones in our industry is right networks and cloud nine. These people typically charge per user. I have a slide just on right networks because that's my preferred partner for managed hosting. And I'll tell you about some of the pros and cons of working with right networks. Then on the self-managed cloud computing, there's actually tons of companies that offer that, but the biggest names out there are Microsoft Azure, Amazon Web Services, and Google Cloud. And I've tested all three of them, and it does require some medium sophistication on just kind of understanding how servers work. But you can, within an hour, you can launch your own Windows server uh, self, almost like a self-hosted system, but you pay Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, or Amazon Web Services for it. And then lastly, simple file sharing tools. A Google Drive works really well. OneDrive, if you have a Microsoft Office 365 subscription, works really well, and Dropbox. Now there's Qbox, which I'm gonna have a couple of slides on, and I actually have the CEO of Qbox that's gonna come in for a couple of minutes just to kind of share some thoughts. And Qbox is basically like a Dropbox, for uh, QuickBooks desktop, uh, probably, probably the best way to, to explain it, okay? Um, all right, so let's compare some of the remote control uh, tools. So I've actually used all these tools and I have my own uh, pros and cons to each one, so let me run through them. So TeamViewer, currently my tool of choice. I have used TeamViewer for about six years. Six years I've been using it. TeamViewer is up 99.9% .9 of the times. What I love about TeamViewer is that it's really easy to install for the end users. I don't need to be involved in the installation process. I don't have to give them a special link to install it. They just go to teamviewer.com, download the app, give me their numbers, and I'm good to go. TeamViewer is going to cost you $600 per year for one user. And uh, it's about $2,500. Is that right? about $2,400 per year for uh, multi-user, multi-instance. We have about four licenses in, or five licenses in our office. So we can have five people connected to unlimited number of clients. Now, you can have unlimited clients. That means that doesn't matter how many clients you access, you have it with that one user license, you can access it with TeamViewer, but it's a single session. So I cannot be in two clients logged in at the same time. So that's why I like TeamViewer because I've never logged into two clients at the same time and I'm paying per user for the actual person remoting in and it's $600 a year or $50 a month. Now, I would say in the past four years, no, about three years, Splashtop has, has grown super, super fast. Tons of people use Splashtop. I'm getting tons of positive comments about Splashtop. Um, I used it a little bit a couple of years ago. I, honestly, I can't teach an old dog new tricks. I really liked uh, Team Viewer. I like that I, again, it was easy for me to get clients to download Splashed Up without me getting too involved. So I, I, that's why, I mean, Team Viewer, that's why I use Team Viewer. But what I like about Splashed Up is they have a $5 a month version, $60 a year for one user, two computers. So if you're only managing 
two clients, you know, 60 bucks a year is obviously a, you know, a 10th of the team viewer price. Now, if you have a lot of clients, Splashed Up has a remote support pro edition that's $300 a year. It's unlimited users. So you can have as many team members as possible connected into, uh, into your Splashed Up account, but you can only have 15 computers that you remote into. So this is not the computers that connect to the computers. These are the computers you remote into. So you can have a limited number of people uh, remoting in up to 25 computers. So it's a different, uh, it's a different uh, model altogether. Now, LogMeIn Pro, honestly, I used to use LogMeIn when I first started. At this point, I no longer see the value proposition in LogMeIn. Um, and and that this is probably why you saw the Zoom stock go up and up and up while the market was crashing and the, and the, uh, and, and the, the go to my PC and go to webinar and the, the, all that brand, you know, the go-to brand, it's all going down probably because, you know, they, they kind of stayed back in the times in terms of innovation and the pricing model. Again, I don't see, I still don't see go to my PC as the tool of choice. I would love to know in your comments if any of you absolutely love go to my PC. I think at TeamViewer, it's a better value proposition, but it's really neat. You get unlimited computers for one user for $420 a year. So go to my PC is technically cheaper than TeamViewer, but to get a customer, to get a client, to get a person you support into it, you have to send them a deployment link and they have to follow a very specific set of instructions. So I really like uh, the fact that okay, TeamViewer, it's just really simple to install. Then there's Chrome Remote Desktop, which is free. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. You know, so as long as you have somebody launches remote control desktop, they give you the numbers, you can connect to it. It's free. It's basically for one user, one computer, but every person has a free account. So there's no limitation. As long as people give you the, the, the code from the remote desktop uh, 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 app, you can launch it. It's an extension from your Google Chrome. It's actually pretty amazing. I mean, like most Google products, it's amazing. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about Google Chrome uh, that remote desktop is that there's no unattended access. That means it physically requires someone to say, uh, to give you the number to connect. Whereas all the other tools, TeamViewer, SplashTop, LogMeIn, GoToMyPC, all of them have the option for unattended access, which means you can log in at the middle of the night and control those computers. Um, and then we have Zoom, which in my opinion is not a great remote control tool, but it works like if when you have a Zoom meeting, one person can click share and then they click on the button that says, allow someone, um, allow someone to uh, allow the other person to control my computer. So Zoom allows you to do this and it kind of works. I, I find it to be a bit lagging or slow, specifically for remote control. I think Zoom's amazing, but for remote control, it's not, eh, I'm not really a big fan of it. Uh, it's free uh, and for up to 40 minutes and you can record the session, which is pretty cool. Uh, none of the other tools are great for recording the session, although TeamViewer records, but it doesn't record the communication, the voice part. Uh, it can just record records the screen. So, um, so I think Zoom is a good alternative, and it's, it's, it could be free if it's a short session or $15 per user. It doesn't have a limit to how many clients or customers you can, you can use, and there's no unattended access. There are other tools like AnyDesk, uh, VC, remotepc.com, but I personally have never used them. I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to mention them because I can't speak intelligent about them. These are the tools that I have used, and this is probably the, what I think is a good summary to compare them all. Now, let's talk about QBox for a second. So QBox is, it has a very specific purpose, and the reason why I wanted to mention QBox by itself and call it out it's because if you're a QuickBooks desktop user and you need to, in the most quickest, fastest way, get a remote setup functional in which you don't interrupt the other computer, that you don't remote into it, that you just share the QuickBooks desktop file, QBox to me is the best choice. Um, it's $12 a month. It only works in QuickBooks. Uh, I mean, uh, only works on Windows. QuickBooks for Windows or both sites. Both people need to have Windows installed and both people need to have QuickBooks installed in their computer. Um, and it's called, I call it a turn-based file locking mechanism. I, I call it turn-based because I'm a, 
I'm a board gamer. I play a lot of board games and turn based is a concept in board games, which means while it's your turn to work on the file, you have complete control and the other person can't do anything, can't press any buttons, can't add any new transactions, can't, can't do anything. I mean, technically they could, but it messes up the whole process. So the turn-based file locking mechanism locks the other user from accessing QuickBooks or as, as still at least it warns them, hey, you know, your accountant's working on the file. You shouldn't be doing anything right now. It has one big con, one big drawback, which is while the remote desktop is working, you cannot have multi-user access. So you cannot have someone working on QuickBooks desktop uh, in their physical office and the remote QBox user at the same time. Again, this is a $12 a month solution. If you want to work multi-user access, then you go to something like Right Networks. However, I brought in the CEO of QBox uh, to the webinar. Let's see if he's here. And I'm Chris, here. <laughs> so one thing to mention, Chris is in the Bay Area, so he's currently mm -hmm. under quarantine. So I, I think it's, a, <laughs> it's, it, it's just poetic, you know, that, that that's the circumstance. Yeah. So Chris, I'll give well, you a few minutes. Okay, thank you. And and the funny things you guys are talking about, they so resonate with me because when we started this company, I, I worked out of this house down, you know, one level down. And so I remember working from home. I remember, you know, all the things that we're all trying to figure out now. And now we have an office in South San Jose, thankfully, but now I'm working from home because as of yesterday, the entire San Francisco Bay Area was told we stay home today. So, or for the next few weeks. So, um, so everything you talked about really resonated with me. And, um, I hope for all of you, this is just a, a time of transition, but something that is very positive for you and helps you to grow relationships, to grow your business and, and works out to be a positive in some way, shape or form. But um, just as Hector mentioned, um, we're, we're an alternative. We don't try to oversell QBox. In fact, um, right off the bat, when someone calls for the first time, we ask them, hey, if you, if you need remote file sharing simultaneously, we're done. We're out the window. We're not a solution for that. So. Um, thankfully, there are a lot of folks that don't need that. We actually have not only been growing year over year, but um, unfortunately, in this current situation, we're growing even faster now. Um, so we, we definitely don't want to oversell the capability of QBox, but if you're looking for a good collaboration solution, um, Hector described it excellently. We, we kind of fit into that niche. So everybody, um, if they're sharing a, a desktop file, we make it really simple to collaborate. Um, so um, definitely something, if you want to check it out, you can find us at qboxplus.com. But um, otherwise, again, I, I really appreciate Hector's perspective on all this reaching out to me yesterday. We talked about the fact that um, this is just a, it's a time of change for all of us. It's a, a new norm, um, which, you know, as Michael was talking about, I mean, I've been born and raised here in Silicon Valley. So, you know, working remotely is something that's pretty common around this area. But I know for a lot of folks, <clears throat> especially when you're told you have to do it, uh, it's just different. It's a transition and you do have to figure out internet speeds and, and devices for your you know, computer and applications to use to make your work continue to be efficient. Um, so I, again, if, if we can help out with any of that, if you have questions, um, only because I jokingly said I, I learned from experience starting out this business from home, moving to an office, now being back at home working. Um, you know, it's, it's not a, a huge thing for us. We actually have a phone system that's a voiceover system. Um, we've actually been chatting as I've been here um, through a Zoho resource we use with you know, our support staff. Um, so we, we use a lot of um, you know, resources on the web that make our lives easier to do this. So it, it wasn't a big deal for all of us yesterday to say, okay, we'll see you in you know, six weeks or three weeks or four weeks. Um, but I know for a lot of you, it is a big transition. So um, again, if, there, if there's anything you'd like to fire at us, ask any questions. I think Michael did an exceptional job, as did Hector, as always. Um, but if there's anything we can help you out with, any questions we can answer, we'd love to do that for you. So thank you again, Hector, for including uh, me today on behalf of QBox. And, uh, and if you're curious about QBox, please um, check out our website. We'd love to answer any questions that you have um, if you're looking for a collaboration solution. So um, best of luck to all of you. Again, in these times, it's just a time for us to, to grow together, not grow apart. Um, really hope for all of you that, you know, this is a time where you can strengthen your bonds with your family members and friends and, and make the best of a, of a difficult situation. And as Hector mentioned, the ultimate objective is for all of us to get through this and, and deal with this hidden you know, virus that, that all of us are just learning about, the things we read about. 
um, but we can all come out of it successfully and, and just thrive as a community. So thank you again, Hector, for including me. Best of luck to all of you and, hey, and uh, Chris, have a uh, wonderful day. Before you leave, I wanted to ask you a quick yeah, question. Okay. What, what okay. insights do you have? What, what have you learned from, you know, this business, Qbox has been going on for what, six, seven years? How long have you been in business for? Yeah, so the corporation started actually in 2009 and Qbox has been around since 2011. So nine years this year, actually. Okay. So. And, and the reason why this, this came out is because people were using Dropbox to, to share the QuickBooks right. desktop files and it was breaking QuickBooks desktop files. It was creating conflicted copies. So my question to you is in this last 15, well, no, you said 2001? Wow. Okay. In this last many years that you've been doing this, what have you learned? Interesting? 11. If I said one, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. 2011. Okay. Yeah. So what have you learned interesting in the last nine years about just QuickBooks desktop in general and the demand mm -hmm. and the use for it? Do you see QuickBooks desktop slowing down or what, what has QuickBooks online affected your business at all? Actually it hasn't. I, in fact, I think um, there, there's kind of a, there, there's, you know, people have this mental picture because of a lot of things you read about SaaS and about options that are cloud-based that um, if they're not moving to SaaS, that they're, they're kind of missing the boat. And so again, our, and, and no, we haven't, I mean, QuickBooks online, um, you know, without going into too much detail, there's still a lot of folks that are using desktop. And so we, we grow and we accelerate every year, um, regardless of what happens. And, you know, our, I mean, there's some nuances of our product. We've never raised our price into existing users, not once. Um, so there's some things we've tried to do just to, you know, provide a good service to our clients. But having said that, um, we're, we're not out to convince people we're better than SaaS. We just want people to know there's an alternative. If you have desktop folks, for whatever reason, you know, it's interesting. Our user groups are, we, we get people with crappy internet that say, hey, I don't want to live on a browser all day. So this Qbox thing makes sense because, you know, the only time they need internet is when they close the file or deactivate it. So we have all these unique user groups. Some people say, oh gosh, I have a lot of inventory, so I got to stay on desktop. Other people, you know, whatever their reasoning is, we don't try to convince them one way or the other. We just say, hey, look, here's a great way to collaborate. And so if, if QBO is not a fit for you or zero is not a fit for you, here's something that's going to help simplify your interaction on desktop. So so long answer to your question, we, we haven't, our business has not been affected by any sort of um, uh, implied growth of SaaS or any other cloud-based products. And, and again, we, we still think people should use, you know, cloud-based services to simplify their life, even with desktop, because a lot of them do integrate with desktop. So, um, but, but again, long answer to your question, we haven't seen any sort of slowdown. We've only seen acceleration. So. Awesome, Chris. All right, man. So I'm going to go ahead and run a quick polling question here. If people are okay. interested in doing a deep dive webinar, just in QBox. So, so if we get some interest on that, we'll, we'll share that. Chris, thank you very much. Awesome. Man. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank Please you very much for the invitation. Have a great day, everyone. Best of luck to everyone. Yeah. So he's, he's in the Bay area, which, you know, the, the shelter in place, I think they call it, which means they could only leave to the grocery store, to the doctor, to the pharmacy and to put gas. I think those are the four specific circumstances. So, if, if you live in the Bay Area, I'm sorry, you have to deal with this. And again, you know, I think we're all in this together, trying to fight this invisible enemy that we never thought we needed to. So I got a polling question up. Uh, if you think it would be interesting to do a webinar just on QBox, maybe QBox versus Right Network, something like that, that could be interesting. Let me go ahead and end the poll. And let's go to uh, talk about Right Networks. So Right Networks, which is my, my like I, I would say my, my two favorite, my three favorite tools for remote work, QuickBooks desktop is gonna be TeamViewer uh, for me to remote into my client's computers and control the computer mostly to do training. Uh, QBox, if they want me to kind of, the middle of the night log in, do a couple of things, and I don't wanna log into their computer for whatever reason, I prefer not to log into the computer, I wanna have QuickBooks on my side. And third, for full multi-user cloud collaboration, a hosted, a managed hosted platform works. I use Right Networks really mostly because Right Networks has been very supportive of, of my content, my webinars. They go to all the conferences that I go to. Everybody at Right Networks has been extremely use, uh, friendly. 
uh, and, uh, and, um, and useful. Like they, they've always thrown resources at the community helping us out. So I, I continue to support Right Networks and recommend them, although you know, they have many competitors. So Right Networks is great for hosting QuickBooks Desktop, Microsoft Office, and documents, right? Your QuickBooks desktop file, your Microsoft Office. You access all these applications remotely using a PC, Mac, or Chromebook. So any, um, any, any, uh, any computer that can do remote Microsoft remote desktop, it can access it. Um, technically, a tablet could work, but it's not the same experience if you don't have a mouse and keyboard. The price, again, the, I don't know if the price will change or if it's different. It's about $55 per user. You can have unlimited company files. I've never really seen a, a, a hard limit on how much data you can store on right networks. I'm sure that there are some outliers that hit the limits and, and press their computer system too hard, but you can have unlimited company files in one right networks account, but you're going to pay per user and every user uh, that accesses QuickBooks needs to have its own, its own account. Um, one of the, so I, I tell you the pros and cons of each. One of the cons to right networks, one of the one of the limitations to right networks is the additional apps. Unfortunately, if you want to add an app that has not been vetted by them, it's like a two to three month process to get the app in. I've seen them sometimes get a little bit faster, but I think because right networks has so many clients and so many uh, people accessing it, they have to be really, really cognizant and aware of the type of apps that they're adding into their systems so it doesn't add stress to their uh to their network so it doesn't obviously create corruption or a virus or something like that so right networks is going to take responsibility on your file they're going to do backups on your file so in order to make sure that nothing goes wrong with your data they they have a really long vetting process for third-party apps so you might want to check out the apps directory first to see if whatever app you're using or want to use, it's compatible with Right Networks before you move on to Right Networks. So that's it with Right Networks. I run a quick other polling question. Just wondering how many people um, are aware of Right Networks or need to learn uh, Right Networks. Do I have, uh, let me see. Uh, I don't have a poll on Right Networks, but uh, I guess you just put in the, in the comments below, do you think a, um, do you think a, 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 a webinar just on how to use right networks would be useful? Um, so this would be per month. Could somebody, somebody was asking, is it per year or is it per month? Yeah, it's $55 per month. So with, with, a, with a webinar, just put it in the comments. With a right networks webinar would be useful for you. Put it in the comments, uh, whether you're on Facebook or, or Zoom, whatever it is. All right, so let's talk about, um, this is, uh, self-hosted remote desktop and this is we, we talked about if you have your own server if you have your own your own system um some of the some of the pros ha about having a self-hosted remote desktop that's what we have in our office by the way we are on a self-hosted remote desktop is that there really isn't any additional cost i don't pay any additional monthly fees i don't i don't pay any uh, service fees although I, every once in a while i gotta call my it guy and ask them to do something and that has some costs associated with it. You know, if I have to create a new user, delete a user, uh, something like that, I, I might need an IT person to help me with that. And what I like, it's I get the most amount of control. I can add any apps I want. I don't have to go through a vetting process. So I find that the, the, the self-hosting solution, it's a great one. Again, if, you, if, you, if you're not a big fan of, um, um, of, the IT part of setting up user permissions, all that stuff, you might, you, you might not want to do that. You might want to, uh, you know, maybe a, a fully hosted solution. So now we have the cloud, comp this is cloud computing. So the cloud computing, let's just fix that real quick. So our cloud computing remote desktop tools. Now this is, this is a little bit tricky because they don't charge per user. They don't charge per company file. They don't charge per megabyte they charge for computing power and bandwidth. So it's just really, it's, it's kind of, um, it really is a surprise box what the bill is gonna be at the end of the year. I used Amazon Web Services server for a couple of months and Microsoft Azure because I was testing it out. I wanted to see if I wanted to move in that direction. And I was paying around $200, $250 a month to have a virtual Windows server with a couple of people 
accessing it. So I would say expect a couple hundred dollars at least to be what you spend on these on, on, on these services. Now, I think you have to have really um, a much larger business because you'll probably get to $500 really quick, I think. Um, so just wanted to mention it. That's out there. Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, that's out there. You could check it out. I'm, I'm probably going to do a video soon on how to, how to get up and running with one of these. Um, again, but that's just, just some time I have to dedicate uh, to that. Um, so that's an option. Just wanted to throw it out there. Now, I want, let's move on to web productivity tools. Um, Office 365 comes with something called OneDrive. So if you're paying the, the Office 365 service, which I think is between $12 and $15 a month per user, it comes with OneDrive, which is basically like a Dropbox type of technology made by Microsoft, where all the Microsoft Word documents, PowerPoint documents, Excel documents, Microsoft Access, whatever documents you're using with Office 365, if you save it in OneDrive, everybody in your team has access to it. Everybody in your team can make changes to it. And the new Office 365 2016 and above, which comes automatically when you know, the updates come automatically, it, all, of their, all, their, um, all their software has now built in um, versioning and, uh, and, and user control. So if you open Office, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, a tool like Excel, and you make changes to it, and it's in, G, in uh, OneDrive, you can see who changes what, similar to how Google Drive and GC work. So, so the Dropboxes of the world and, and, uh, and, the, and, the, Google, and the Google Drives of the world kind of pushed Microsoft into this whole OneDrive concept. It's a great tool if, if you like the, the desktop version of uh, Excel, Word, and PowerPoint, OneDrive is a great choice. They also have this concept that's called Office Online, which is a web-based version of the office, which is really weak. You know, like if you open Excel, maybe like a 20th of the functionality, it's there. A 10th of the functionality is there. Word is very basic. PowerPoint is very basic. So they do have full web-based versions of the applications that you don't need to install in a computer. It could technically work in a Google Chrome, uh, in a Chromebook uh, computer or in a tablet. However, um, again, it's, it's limited functionality. So I still think that the desktop versions of Word, Excel, PowerPoint uh, are, are just more powerful. And also access is only available on a, on a desktop version. Then we have Google Drive or G Suite, where we have Google Sheets, Google Docs, and Google Slides. To be honest, in our office, we have Office 365. And whenever I have to work on a big Excel file that I need to clean up to import into QuickBooks, I will definitely use desktop-based Microsoft Excel. But if we have a spreadsheet in our office that we're all updating because we're adding information about uh, new people signed up to our next QuickBooks class or whatever, then we, we use Google Sheets no matter what. Uh, for example, uh, Michael and I, as we were preparing for this webinar, we used a Google Doc. So we opened up a Google Doc together and we added some of our brainstorming. And then when we put the slides together, as you can tell, we built them all in Google Slides, because you know, he, me and him are in two different states. We were collaborating on building these things together. So that's where Google Drive and G Suite, uh, which is a better choice. But if I'm building my own Excel spreadsheet with a lot of formulas on my own, and I don't need to collaborate, I would probably just use uh, 365. Now I can share it with OneDrive so multiple people can access it. But again, if the whole building process, and you know, from the moment you start to you end, will be only done by one user, I still prefer the desktop tools. Now, I experimented with something called Soho Cloud Suite. And Soho Cloud Suite is, it's another company's attempt to get into the Microsoft and the Google Drive G Suite business. So I encourage you to check it out. Just go to, Zo just type Zoho with a Z. And it's amazing how many tools they have. They have CRM, they have Word, they have, you know, spreadsheets, they have built-in email, they have a cloud-based, a SaaS-based, complete office productivity tool. Uh, you have to be the type of person that's adventurous enough to be comfortable with not using Excel or not using Google Sheets or Google Docs to go into Soho, but it's a great alternative and it's fully web-based. They don't even have desktop versions of their software, which is a testament of how new software companies are building their technology from scratch. So those are the three to look at 
in our office, we use both Office 365 and Google Drive. We don't use the online version of the Office apps and we don't use Soho, but I've used them and I like them. But for me, Office 365 and G Suite has been the best combination. Now there are two tools that I, I will confess I don't use that, that often. I have learned how to use these tools from my friend, Seth David. So check out his YouTube channel, Nerd Enterprises. He's got tons of content on Airtable, which is a web-based data. Think of a web-based database. And you can build, you can almost build an entire software program per se, quote unquote, uh, using, um, using uh, Airtable. So it's a whole database system. You can build a lot of functionality with it all from scratch. Check out his videos on it. YouTube has a couple of videos on that. And then there's Smartsheet, which is basically like, imagine a collaborative spreadsheet on steroids, but it's not just a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet that is meant to be used to, uh, to update all the time. So if you want to build a spreadsheet in which you, you add updates to a, to a job, to a client, to a project, uh, you want to check out Smartsheet. Again, I, I'm not good enough at either one of those tools. I just know what they are. I'm aware of them. I have some clients that use them. I think it's just worth mentioning them. Now let's move on to communication and collaboration tools. You heard a lot about Zoom. Zoom is probably the big boy in the marketplace. It's probably the one that has grown the most, grown the fastest, the one that has had the most popularity. Uh, you just go to zoom.us. They have a free account. I think that made a, I think that helped them grow, giving everybody a free account. You have a free account, so you want to maximize the free account first. You can record with it. Now, all the tools allow recording at this point, but uh, Zoom is really great to make a quick meeting, record it, and give somebody a link to access that recording. So there's a free version, and there's a $15 per user version that doesn't have any limitations. I believe that the free version, the limit is 40 minutes. So if you, if, you, if you turn on recording on the free version, you're limited to, uh, to 40 minutes. If recording is not on, I don't think there's a limit. There's this Google Hangouts, which is free. Um, you can check it out. I, I, I'm not a big fan of the tools inside Google Hangouts, but we did use them at the beginning. I really don't like the, the screen sharing and the remote control aspect of Google Hangouts. I don't find it that, I find it a bit clunky. So if I had to compare Google Hangouts versus Zoom, I would say Zoom takes it. GoToMeeting and BlueJeans are also two very popular ones. Uh, I know Intuit uses uh, BlueJeans. So, um, so it sounds to me that these two are, are gonna be more popular in legacy, uh, large type of companies. Uh, but I think that for the small practitioner, for the small business, nothing beats Google Hangouts and Zoom, especially Zoom. Now, team communication tools. In our office, we use Slack. We love it. What we've done is we've told everybody, if something is not important enough to go on an email, put it on Slack. So Slack is a built-in team channel. And I've, I've also done Slack with customers and I've done Slack's, Slack with, uh, with colleagues when I have you know, um, mastermind groups and, 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 and group-based uh, tutorials and training. So Slack is a great private chat you can build and he has tons of tools. And I think what makes Slack truly great is how many, it's how many apps it integrates with. Slack can integrate with G Suite. It can integrate with Zoom. It can integrate with Gmail. It can integrate with CRM applications. I think Slack takes the cake right now. Now, Microsoft response to Slack is Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams is kind of like uh, you took Skype for communications and then took you know, some sort of chat program. I don't know if Microsoft ever had a chat program and then make it into one thing called Microsoft Teams, which is internal, internal communications, internal chat, internal uh, file transfer, that sort of thing. And then oh, I've never used Facebook Workplace. I know I have a friend, uh, Ryan, that talks about it. He, he likes it a lot. It's an option. You're going to pick one of the three, of course. Then we have workflow apps. Now, I have used an app called uh, Aero Workflow for many years because it was meant for accountants. Over time, my, my, uh, my employees grew accustomed to, uh, to a, a tool called monday.com, which is a little bit leaner, a little bit easier. It's got less moving parts. It's got less configuration, um, but it feels a lot more customizable. And that's why we moved to monday.com. We're using, we, uh, 
couple, like half of my team members are using monday.com the other half are not and they're, they're coming back and telling us that they like it so we probably will be permanently using monday.com as a team workflow app we're still looking at options i mean workflow is one of those apps that you always you know look for better options because you can you can never get enough more efficient workflow i've also played with trello asana carbon jetpack workflow honestly they're all good any workflow app you pick is going to be good as long as you use it and people update it and people don't forget to add information to it you're good to go what i yet have not been able to find it's a workflow app and a crm app that that works that that is great for both things uh soho crm has some status updates kind of workflow components in Sightly, which is the crm app that we use has some workflow and um, your status update components but it's just not robust enough i've used method crm as well uh, with some of my clients what i like about method crm is that it fully integrates with quickbooks it's fully integrated so if there are some uh if there's some data in quickbooks that you want to see in your crm side method will likely be the best but again method has a it's, it's a much longer, harder configuration process. So you might need to even hire a method consultant, just like Salesforce, to be able to configure it and customize it to your needs. But in terms of a, like a quick up and running CRM program, that's not a lot of configuration from the get-go. I think Insightly and Soho CRM are probably the best too. If you want something that's more marketing driven, more pipeline driven, more kind of like a drip and closing process or funnel driven, HubSpot and PipeDrive are good CRM tools. I know my friend Michael uses HubSpot because he manages leads from all over the country and he needs that. Um, a, a couple of uh, my friends use uh, in the industry use PipeDrive and they swear by it. I, I personally use Insightly just because, look, I'm always going to use what my team uses. Right? So if my team is happy with Slack, we'll keep Slack. If my, my team's happy with Monday.com, we'll keep that because all these tools, communication, workflow, and CRM, it's about usage, not about how great they are. It's are people using it? Are people feeding it with information? Are people going back and looking at them? Now, let's talk about cloud accounting. And I think a lot of you are familiar with this, right? So the, the three big ones, QuickBooks Online, Zero, and FreshBooks. In my opinion, FreshBooks is sort of disqualified from cloud accounting because it's, really it's really not a GL software. It doesn't have reconciliation. It, it doesn't feel like a general ledger software. It feels more like an end user PL management software, but it's up there and it's growing. I think Zero and QuickBooks Online are the only true uh, uh, cloud based apps worth looking at. Of course, people that know me know that I'm going to be biased towards QuickBooks Online because that's the app that I like. Build payment apps. So it used to be that build.com was the only choice. Um, but it's not. <laughs> we have Pluto, great, great company that, that, that's a competitor to build.com. We have Veeam, great for international payments. We have Melio, which honestly I've never used, but it came into the map because a really good friend of mine was hired by Melio. And I know he wouldn't have taken that job unless the app is great. So I'm going to give it some free advertising here. Then for payroll, obviously we have the QuickBooks Online payroll platform. We have Gusto, which is um, which a lot of people that use Zero use Gusto. Although there are some QuickBooks users that use Gusto. Uh, there's Patriot software, which I've never used, but I've seen their demos in the in the in the conferences. And if you're going to be using one of the big companies like ADP, Paychex, CompuPay, or whatever, I would just use ADP. They're all pretty much the same to me anyway. Might as well use the most powerful one. ADP is extremely well responsive when there's a problem. Their platforms were very clunky for a very long time, or their new platform this year is a lot better. So I think if you're going to outsource payroll to one of the big companies, just use ADP. If you want more control, then you want to look at QBO, Payroll, Gusto, or Patriot Software. Now, for time tracking, there are so many time tracking programs out there. Um, I probably should fill up uh, this with so many, but honestly, if you're using QuickBooks, you shouldn't even look at anything else. The, the, the best integrated, most integrated, best customer service uh, timesheet app that I've worked with, it's T-Sheets. So I, would, I wouldn't even waste my time with anything else. Uh, for receipt capture, there's Receipt Bank, which is 
sort of a, a single use app. It really the only purpose of Receipt Bank is taking a picture of a receipt and hoping that with integration with QuickBooks, it automatically matches or attaches itself to the existing transactions or you use Receipt Bank as the initial data entry process. Receipt Bank will read the receipt, the vendor, the date, the amount, and, and take away a lot of the data entry. There's Neat that works very similar to Receipt Bank. Honestly, I, Neat is kind of a kind of a dying animal. You know, they used to be well known for their physical hardware for their scanners. Now I I, I used to see Neat scanners in everybody's office. Nowadays, I don't I don't even um, you know I don't even see the Neat scanners anymore. There's uh, Auto Entry, which actually allows you to do a lot of things. You can scan receipts, you can scan invoices, you can scan bills, you can scan purchase orders, you can scan bank statements. I think it's a pretty good receipt bill capture app. It has a lot of moving parts. There's also HopDoc, um, which I, I didn't mention honestly, just because I, I've been a bit disappointed with uh, the direction of HopDoc lately. I've been disappointed with the amount of uh, banks that they connect with. And, and honestly, they're sort of their own category. They're, they're more of a bank fetching app. And, and, and for the, the few banks that it works with, HopDoc is amazing. It's incredible. The people that work in HopDoc, they're amazing and they're incredible. HopDoc was bought out by zero. That doesn't change anything. I really like the app. But uh, I, I didn't want to make its own category. But actually, let's, uh, we'll put it up here. We'll add it. So we'll call it uh, bank fetching. So HopDoc is one of those things that you want to try it. If it works well with your, with your banks, then great. If it doesn't, don't get frustrated. You probably have to wait a few months until they can get it uh, to work. Then for sales tax management, there's TaxJar, Taxify, and Avalar Tax. Honestly, I don't pick one. I let my customer pick it, and then I adapt to it. For tax planning, one amazing app that's out there is called Tax Planner Pro. Probably one of the most underrated apps in the entire ecosystem is Tax Planner Pro. Um, I've, I've used Tax Planner Pro for a couple of years now. It's an app that connects to your QBO and based on a couple of things that you add, it proactively plans your estimated tax payments. It saves me so much time from having to manually do uh, tax planning for my clients. Once you put the Tax Planner Pro and attach it to, to, uh, to, to QuickBooks Online, it's your estimated tax payments are pretty much on automatic. And my 1099 uh, app of choice has been uh, Tax 1099. Although I do use the built-in QuickBooks Online 1099 platform when I have all my data in QuickBooks Online already. But if I need to make uh, 1099s manually, I use text, Tax 1099. And um, I have clients that need need a 1099 INT and, and just different weird types of 1099s that we have to do uh, that are not the regular miscellaneous one, that app works really well. For. Now let's move on to hardware. So I own two scanners. I have a Fujitsu IX1500, which I love. Great scanner, but it's got a little tiny screen this big. And then I have the Raven Pro, uh, which has a huge, like, I don't know, like a seven inch screen. And, um, and I got to tell you, the Raven Pro is just faster in every way. Like for me to change a setting, for me to select whether I want to fax from the scanner or if I want to email it to someone or if I want to email it to myself or if I want to send it to my Dropbox. I mean, Raven Pro to me takes the cake. I've been using it uh, this tax season. I mean, it scans like 50 to 100 pages a minute. It, it's just incredible how fast it, it scans black and white. But I don't want to discount the Fujitsu. It's a great scanner as well. Um, it is $400 versus $650. I think the Raven Pro, it's a bit overpriced when it comes to it being compared to the Fujitsu. I would love to see that come down to more of the $500 range, but uh, it's, it's innovative, it's new, it's different. And I think that if you want to have a really big screen with a big preview, I love it, you get a preview. And, and when you scan something in the screen, you can rotate, you can change the order of the pages. I mean, it's almost like a mini computer. So if you want to do a lot of, uh, work prior to send emailing it or prior to getting it. If you don't want to mess too much in the computer, Raven Pro is a great, is a great cloud-based, 100% cloud-based scanner where everything you scan can be manipulated on the computer before you send it 
to yourself, to a client, or to any cloud-based application. And I spoke to the CEO and I made him promise me that at some point in the near future, there will be a direct Raven Pro scan to QBO attachments feature. And I offered all the help in the world because if you can do that, you completely blow everybody out of the water. If, you can, if I can scan straight to QBO with a scanner, I think that's going to be a game changer. So I'm hoping that one of these two guys, Fujitsu and Raven Pro, do that first. But I'm, I can't recommend uh, Raven Pro enough. And in my YouTube channel, I have a, a, a tutorial uh, of, uh, of how to use the scanner if you want to check it out. Now, one thing that's going to be absolutely needed is going to be a USB headset. If you're going to be communicating with your team, with your, with your clients online, you can spend less than $50 and get a, a great headset like the Logitech H390 or the H510. Uh, one thing I'll tell you, one thing I didn't look hard enough when it came to the USB headset, I want one that has the three and a half inch plug and the separate USB adapter. Because sometimes, for whatever reason, I don't want to take on a USB uh, uh, space and I just want to plug it into my microphone input. I can do that if I have that. But if it's only 100% USB, then, then you can't. So um, one of the things that I like about having the three and a half uh, plug instead of the USB uh, is that you can actually plug it to an iPhone. So you can plug the, 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 uh, a, a three and a half inch um, USB heads, not USB headset through an iPhone or through a phone with the adapter. And you can actually use zoom from your phone with a headset, which I think is a great, great choice as well. Um, the Sennheiser, I mean, it's going to be 75 bucks. The Logitech is going to be anywhere between 20 and 25. Logitech is only USB. Look, if you're going to be on the computer all the time and never going to be in another device and you get, just get a USB one, spend 25 bucks. That's really all you need. Once you have this, you have 99% of the tools you need to communicate uh, remotely. Then a webcam. Look, any webcam really works. The only thing I have, I have a couple of pet peeves. The webcam that's built into the uh, laptops, unfortunately, it's on top of the screen. So what's going to end up happening is you're always going to have this, this look to it, right? Where the, where the, the camera sort of from below. And um, I just don't think it's an appealing look. Like the, I think the camera should always be above, above your eyes. Like, like right now, this camera is right on my forehead. That's why it looks really cool. But when you speak to someone sort of from, from above, when the camera's coming from the bottom, I just, first of all, in my opinion, one is just not appealing at all. <laughs> you know, I, I, and, uh, and, and second, I just don't think it's, a, it's, it's, it's just a respectful look. So I like to have my own webcam that I can put on top of my screen. And if I can't put it on top of my screen, make sure the webcam has a little screw in the bottom so you can hook it up to a tripod, a mini tripod, a desk tripod, so you can manually put the camera, again, above your head. You want that. That's going to be a really good look. I'm telling you, when you're meeting with your clients, if you have that weird where the camera is looking at the bottom of your head, at, at your chin, at your neck, you know, from that bottom down, from that bottom up view, it's just not going to be as pleasant. So I would strongly recommend invest in a webcam and put it above uh, your eyesight. And the last thing is, I don't have this, but I've been tempted to buy this, is to buy a fake bookcase backdrop. <laughs> I don't have that many books, honestly. Uh, most of my books are, are in, uh, in electronic format or audio book or whatever. I could like I'm not gonna go out there and buy a you know a bunch of books just so I can look like I have a library. But if you're looking for, you know, any if you don't have a real bookcase, obviously a real bookcase is great. But you can if you go to uh, Amazon and just type video backdrops, you can see all sorts of ones. I thought this was so funny, you know that 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 love that bookcase uh, style. So you can buy this for like 25 bucks plus the the little metal things that you need to hang it. Uh, and the clips is about 60 or $70, something to look at. I, again, I don't have my own. I've actually built like a little tent in my office that's all darkened and blackened. And, and, and I have, um, let me show you. I have a little, I have like a little curtain here. And this is actually my, the half of my office. But what I do is I, I block this. And when this is up, my kids know, in theory, uh, that they that they shouldn't be coming in and uh, and interrupting uh, me and my work because I'm 
in my tent, I'm in my cocoon. And when I work from home, I, you know, I have to let everybody know this is what I'm doing, right? So I have my own lights here. I have my own webcam here. I have my own setup and I'll, you know, on, on, um, and if, if you go to my website, hectorgarcia.com, you can search in there. There's a, a place where I kind of show you my setup. But what I'll do is I'll, e I'll email everybody the slides and a link of my setup so you can see the hardware that I use. And let's wrap it up with, you know, what are the other tools that are not really things, you know, they're not really uh, investments that we need to make that we, can, that we can apply. So number one, set up a meeting with every one of your clients with Zoom and just say, hey, we're probably gonna be doing a lot of meetings virtually, let's do a test. So get the process started. If you don't use Zoom yourself, tell your clients, I've never used Zoom, I'm gonna start using this, Let's learn together. And some of your clients will surprise you. Some of your clients might already be using Zoom and you're not, and they might be teaching you. So, so hopefully you get to a client sooner rather than later that knows how to use it, that can guide you to the process, and then set up a meeting with every one of your clients so they feel comfortable with it. Um, if your clients don't have a headset, buy them one. Invest the $21 in Amazon and buy your client a USB headset. If you know, your client's gonna have a lot of service providers that are gonna to wanna to work remotely, they're gonna have a lot of communications. In, if in that very Zoom meeting, you see clients speaking into the built-in microphone and the microphone sounds really crap and there's a lot of echo, buy, invest the $21 in your clients, right? Very, very simple, right? You do it in, in other ways, right? You already do it in other ways. Um, also, if you're proud of your new office setup, if you got a really cool office setup, share it. Put a picture in social media. Tell people ready to work from home, ready to take over the world from home, ready to serve my clients from home, up and running, you know, within a week, you know, you know ready to do virtual bookkeeping, whatever it is that you do, post it in social media. If you got, obviously, if it's a mess, don't do it. But if you got a nice setup, post it, you know, let the other people know that you're ready to go, that you're fully productive working remotely. Also, start writing some blog articles about what you've been learning. Okay, what have I been learning about the process? What have I been learning about workflow? What have I been learning about remote work? What have I been learning about software and hardware? Write it. Let the world know that you're evolving. Like Michael said, let's be the leaders of change. Let's make this not a temporary issue of something that's happening to us. Let's be the ones that change this and shape our profession moving forward. Let's shape expectations of how people uh, expect to work with their accountants, with their consultants moving forward. Also, make some videos uh, of how to use Zoom. Make some videos how to use Loom, how to use GoToMeeting, how to use TeamViewer. I've done that. I put in my YouTube channel a, a Loom video, a, a, a TeamViewer video. Um, I proactively want to help people uh, work better with me. If, if my clients take 30 minutes to get Zoom up and running, you're going to be wasting a lot of time with that meeting. But if you proactively send them information or even go to YouTube and find somebody else's video on how to do it, say, hey, watch this video. They'll walk you through it before we meet. Make sure that you have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted or whatever the expression is. Um, write some step-by-step -step guides to document uh, how do you do document sharing. Right? So do step-by-step -step with screenshots. You know, how to use Google Drive, how to use Dropbox, how to use ShareFile, whatever file sharing app you're using with your client, box.com, whatever it happens to be. Write step-by-step -step articles and when you tell your clients, hey, upload your bank statements here, upload your tax returns here, your W-2s here, don't, don't, don't get to the point where now you feel obligated to spend 30 minutes with them one-on-one -on -one to walk them through the process. Write the step-by-step, -step, guys. You'll be surprised how many of your clients will read the step-by-step -step guide and do it. And um, my last idea here is run a monthly video webinar with all your clients. Talk about the state of your firm. Uh, talk about what new tools you come up with. Maybe some tax news. If there's some tax changes, if the payroll taxes go down, what does that look like? Are there any government grants or programs or loans that can help people affected by, by the coronavirus? Again, we, if, if you want to succeed through this, don't let the circumstances happen to you. Lead the change. Be the force behind making this work. Be the force behind bringing some peace and, and tranquility to your clients. Bring some, be, be the force that brings, uh, that, 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 that is uh, generous and, and, and shares what you have learned. None of these things are things to be kept 
under our sleeve, right? These are all the information is out there to do this, right? If, 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 if you think you can have an edge because you know how to do this better than everyone else, you won't, okay? But if you lead the change, if you, if you, if you lead the education on it, if you let your colleagues and your clients know, you're going to be making it better for every one of us. So with that said, that, that's a webinar. Uh, we're done. I'm going to go through the Q&A. Let me see if I missed anything interesting. Do I have an ending polling question here? Um, I don't. Um, actually, let me launch this quick polling question here. Maybe just to have kind of an ending one. So um, I would love to know, um, uh, you know, did you already work, work remotely? You know, I would love to know how many of you uh, stumbled upon this issue and now have to solve it uh, versus that. Now, somebody says, any recommendation for eFax? So Debbie, I use Ring Central for eFax. I've used it for 10 years probably, but I'm literally gonna cancel it uh, this month because I'm gonna start using my eFax through my new phone system. Um, so that will, because we're changing phone systems. Let's see uh, what else we got here. Um, what micro do you happen to know if a microphone that will work with a Mac? Yeah, so all those microphones work with a Mac, PC and Mac. So the Sennheiser, go back to the microphones here, both the Sennheiser and the Logitech will work with a Mac and both the Logitech and the Microsoft webcams work with a Mac. So uh, what phone system are you switching to? So we're uh, switching to Nextiva, Marrera. We're switching to Nextiva. As a matter of fact, if by the end of the day, we don't change our mind and move to Zoom instead, uh, we, will, we will move forward with uh, Nextima. So we're between Zoom phones and Nextiva, as a matter of fact. Uh, but we've already decided on Nextiva, but we literally got an invitation for Zoom phones yesterday. And I told my team, watch this before I make the final decision to move to Nextiva. So Michael, you're back. Were you, uh, were you bored of being at home or what? <laughs> I thought you had a hard stop. So we, yeah, we actually just finished. I'm, I'm going through the Q and A. I want to make sure I answer uh, everything. Um, do you want to add anything else, Michael? No, I, 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 uh, my other meeting ended. And so I thought I'd jump back on notice you were doing Q and I was like, Oh, maybe there's other questions that I could help answer. Um, yeah, I'm going through the Q and A now. I think some people are starting to, to log off. I'm just going to maybe spend a couple more minutes. What phone system do you use, Michael? Is there, or everybody uses it? Grasshopper. Grasshopper. Interesting. What, Unbelievable what like system. Grasshopper um, has an app. All your employees can download the app. Um, it gives you extensions. So you can have one number and then extensions for every single person in your company, extensions for departments. It has a voicemail function that, um, that auto emails to an email address and actually types out what the voicemail said. So you can keep your whole team um, connected and you can also transfer calls in the system. So really powerful. And if your employees don't want their cell numbers ever to be given out, you can, they can call from the grasshopper app on their, on their computer or on their phone and call to your customers so that their cell numbers are not shown. It's just the company number that'll show up through grasshopper. So very affordable. Yeah. And while, while I have you, Michael, I want to ask you another question. And this is, this is coming from the chat here. Somebody saying, how do you get qualified independent contractors? How do you build a team with independent contractors? So before you answer the question, so number one, if you can find a talented person that you can subcontract and partner with to, to scale, go ahead and do it. But in my opinion, in my opinion and experience, once you bring a, an internal contractor, a, 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 um, an independent contractor and you teach them how to do everything you know, they're probably gonna go and, and start their own firm anyway. So I think that in, in this business where, where, as Michael says, you know, the, the, the battle for talent is such a complicated one. I think it's probably much better to bring employees in-house. Yep. So do you have any comments on why employees are not contractors, Michael? Yeah, so <clears throat> contractors by definition, um, are a business, you know, just like if you're a solopreneur, you're a contractor, you're a business. So contractors um, are a vendor to you or a, uh, they're a, they're a vendor to you. They're out, they're a third party. And sometimes you can find that unique mix of 
person that is wanting to work with you, but I only recommend contractors if you need a specific specialty that you don't want to have in-house and you would rather have somebody else do that. So for example, if you're a QuickBooks user primarily and you have an opportunity to work with a zero customer, so you want to bring somebody on with zero expertise or you um, are not a desktop user, you need to bring somebody on to help you migrate your uh, clients from desktop to online, use contractors for expertise, but to build a business around contractors that are loyal to you, by definition, a contractor is your vendor. So I find that if you want to build loyalty, you want to scale. Um, as Hector said, you want to bring that talent as employees onto your team. Um, employees work for you and um, employees are more likely going to be lo more loyal to you than a contractor is going to be just by the definition and setup of the relationship. And as an employee, you can dictate how they work, when they work, on what equipment they work. Um, you can't really do that with a contractor. There's a limited amount of scope you can dictate with a contractor because of IRS regulations and your state regulations around that. So, uh, so I always recommend employees, how you find them, uh, there's multiple resources to find them. And um, if you reach out to me on LinkedIn, I can send you the uh, QuickBooks Connect um, session I did on finding remote talent with my HR director, um, where we, we talked about how do you build and find a remote talent. Michael, I'll just email it to everybody uh, yeah, if you want yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, that, would be, that would be interesting. All right, so Michael, we, we, I mean, I think the independent contractor employee remote stress, the, the, the strategy conversations around why that matters, how to build the talent, how to find it. I think that that requires its own webinar. Yes, that's a whole webinar by itself. So let's, let's wrap it up because it's been two hours and we've had, we have 240 people that watched the whole two hours, which is pretty Ooh. amazing. So thank you so much guys for doing that. So uh, Michael, do you have any last, did you miss it? Was there anything important that you missed? Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think guys, again, I can't harp on this. This is a time for leadership. This is an opportunity for us in the profession and any of you watching to be leaders, there will be a need for leaders during this time. And you have the opportunity to be that, whether you're a solo practitioner or somebody with a lot of employees, um, your customers, your family, your friends, they all need leadership right now. They all need courage um, in this time of chaos and anxiety. So be that for them. Um, and let's help each other. Let's work with one another to, to encourage one another to be that for each other as well. Best way to end it. Thank you, guys. And I hope that this remote work journey, it's a positive one and help us lead the change. And I'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.